The end of 78, inside an African compound. Angry drums beat out a New Year message, bitter words. Our children are dying of hunger. Food is what we need. Conditions are getting worse. We may as well be dead. We hope our children will have a better future. A future still remote. For blacks, 78 was a year of broken promises, frustrated hopes. 79 looks little better. Do you think that you will have to continue to fight for your Zimbabwe? I shall continue to fight even my comrades. I can see as I meet them, they are very serious about the problem. They won't stop till we get our Zimbabwe. We won't drop down till we get what we want because we had much blood on which is already wasted, of which we won't be get back. I was born here, I intend to die here. We've had our mortar attacks, we've got through them, we live day after day with, with this. And there's no way f or place for me to go. This is my home. And this is where I intend to die. Scotland versus the rest, New Year's Day, the annual bowls match on the greens above Umtali. The players know that the game is over. They look for hope where none exists. Rhodesia stubbornly plays out the myth it has created, a nation alone betrayed by the treachery of its allies, not the obstinacy of its leaders. The lady captain of bowls called us sewer rats. Umtali feels betrayed by Britain. I fought for Britain. I was decorated. And, uh... Today, Britain is letting us down badly. But I will not leave the country. I'll stay here until the end. But your country has got to come in and help us. I don't know how long we can do this alone. Don't know at all. But you don't give up your country. Last autumn, the club was mortared by Mugabe's guerrillas. The golf course singed. The enemy is breathing down Umtali's neck. This may give you some idea of just how close Umtali is to the border. It may not be a stone's throw away, but it's certainly within easy rocket range. Um, Tali's over there, and a couple of miles across the bush is that dirt road. And that dirt road marks the border with Mozambique. Today, the border is mined in an attempt to stem the guerrillas' advance. The border created Amtali's um, prosperity. Now it's squeezing out the life it once gave it. Black faces multiply as whites disappear. Three years ago, there were 10,000 Europeans in Umtali. On New Year's Day, there were 3,000 less. Umtali sets the stage for Rhodesia. Whites leave in the dust a legacy of bitterness. New Year's Day, the wrong side of town. The homes of African workers, tin huts, one room, an oven in summer, an ice box in winter. The shacks are government property. Road construction workers and their families live inside. They used to live in the hills above Amtali. The guerrillas ordered them to leave. The government pays them four pounds a week, no room for luxuries. Zimbabwe seems a long time coming. Do you think that you will get a true Zimbabwe in 1979? Well, I never know because the date we were all waiting for was the 31st of December 1978. And now that things have gone to April, we can never know. Otherwise, we come in, in April the 30th and they say again in November. So we never understand the real situation at present. Do you think there have been any real changes since the transitional government took over? Any difference in your lives? Uh, I should say, since the transitional government took over, there, have, there has been no changes. But since the war began, I've seen some little changes. I support the war because some of the little things have changed. But not since the transitional government took over. 
On the other side of town are white homes, plenty of them, for sale, owners gone. Even if blacks could afford to buy them, as the new year began, they were not allowed to. The Land Tenure Act, the instrument of discrimination that preserves certain areas for whites only, was still on the statute books. The transitional government promised to abolish it. Blacks were still waiting. This house has been on the market for several months. Four bedrooms, the deepest pool in town. Monty and June Pascoe are asking £12,000 for it, but they're open to offers. Monty Pascoe knows that the good times are over. He's off to South Africa. Thank you, Timothy, but you didn't open that one, you stupid thing. But don't worry about it. We'll open he can up. only take £800 with him, the legal limit. Did you always believe that one day you would leave Rhodesia? Never, ever. Now, I was one of the guys going to stay here and switch off the lights in them, Tolia. I was going to switch off the lights and then close the gates and say, right, Rhodesia, farewell. And then burn as we go back. And it didn't happen. I was going to switch off the lights in them, Tolia. But things are happening so fast at the moment. It just. I haven't, got that, I haven't got that much time anymore. You're going and leaving the lights on? That's right. Somebody else left to switch them off. Why don't you stay and, and take the gamble, take the risk? Pete, there is no risk. I mean, there is no gamble, there is a risk, but there's no gamble. The gamble is all in the... The gooks have got it. The who? The gooks. It is. The won. whole world, the whole world is supporting the terrorists. Has the attitude of Africans changed as a result of what is currently happening? Yes. Yes. In what way? Uh, I've got a staff, or the company I work with has got a staff of about eight, eight Africans, and they all think they're going to own houses. And I've never seen so many Africans driving, learning to drive motor cars as what I have lately, because every one of them thinks they're going to get a motor car. Uh, a little garden, we call him a garden boy, was uh, washing my mother-in-law's car. And uh, he said to her, he says, well, next year, that's going to be my car. So my mother went to, my mother-in-law went to him and says, well, you see this box of matches or this lighter? I'll burn it before I give it to you. So that's the attitude of the African. It's changed completely. Ratios here at the moment, I think we are about 34. To one, maybe a bit more, with everybody taking a gap like me. In South Africa at the moment, I think it's about four to one, I think, about four to one. So you could stand a chance. Does that make you feel happier? Well, I could take out four Affies before they take me out. But you couldn't 36? No way, say. Good afternoon. Going through to Marcella? Yep. Right, just. Travel at about 100, 150 meters apart. Mm -hmm. You'll see there's a lot of people on the convoy that have, mm -hmm. you know, have done it a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Just do what they do. Okay? Should you come under attack, go through, unless you're very well back and you can see the contacts well ahead. Is the road okay. very dangerous? Oh, it's a bit dicey at the moment. A few roads in Rhodesia are safe, such is the gorilla's tightening grip. Ten miles south of Omtali, we dropped out of the convoy at Zimunia. Here, the guerrilla's word was law. This is, or was, the African township of Zimunia, a few miles outside of Umtali. Zimunia used to be a thriving township of about 1,500 Africans. That is, until a couple of months ago, when the terrorists moved in and told the people to get out. They did. Today, Zimunia is a ghost town. I use the word terrorists because our government guide was listening. If I'd said guerrillas, a neutral word, there would have been trouble. Zimunia bears signs of a hasty retreat, the beer hall in ruins, the school in ashes. Exercise books littered the floor, some open at the date of the last lesson, October the 30th, 1978. Some left for the safety of Omtali, others caught the bus to Salisbury, 200 miles away. The sufferings of Rhodesia's quarter of a million whites are well known, the plight of her six million blacks less so. Press and TV are heavily censored, journalists closely watched, accompanied most places. Africans caught in the middle are often frightened and confused. Few more so than this 19-year-old soldier in the Rhodesian regular army, 80% of which is black. 
he told us a remarkable story. He said he'd crossed the border and joined the guerrillas, been trained in Tanzania and returned to Rhodesia to fight for Zimbabwe. He was captured in the bush. Why didn't the Rhodesian soldiers kill you when they captured you? Because I, they said, they hold, drop your rifle down. I drop my rifle down. And they catch me, they put in handcuffs. And they, they take me straight to the, to the SB. And special SB, branch. Special branch. And special branch take me here in Namtali. What did they do to you? Was it me every night? I tried to uh, say that I only won, and I don't know about anything near Rhodesia. I tried to start torturing me, like using electricity. He led the army to guerrilla bases across the mountains in Mozambique, which they destroyed. His usefulness over, he was tried by a magistrate. And after that, I went to the high court. And this, the, mem the magistrate said that, what do you want to, to be hanged or to be life in prison or to be saved this Rhodesian government. I say that I want to save the Rhodesian government. And that's why you're now wearing a Rhodesian army uniform. Yes, sir. How do you now feel about fighting men who were once your comrades? Because I can't dare to... They just force me everything, you know. You have no choice? Yeah, they just force me to do it. Why do Africans join the Rhodesian army? Because there's no jobs here in Rhodesia. There's just no jobs for Europeans only. Yeah, no African jobs. So they join? I'm a region army. They join what? To, to fight or for the money? They just fight for money. Don't they fight for Rhodesia? No, they're just fighting for money. Not for? For this country. Because there's some more people there in army, they support Mugabe, you know. People, black soldiers in the army? Yeah. Uh, in the Rhodesian army, support Mugabe? Because if they go to the African township, they have to get a card to pay donation for the people in the bush. Black soldiers? Who do you think will win in the end? I think Mugabe is going to be win because he's got plenty of supporters. Why do you think Mugabe will win? Because he's got long plenty of supporters and plenty of tears in the bush. It was the prospect of an end to the war that led many whites to support the transitional government, but the war has intensified. Whole areas of the country are now under the guerrillas' control. Unload. These protected villages, or keeps, are where the government is holding on by its fingertips. They're designed to control the African population, the majority of whom live in the tribal trust lands. There are 200 keeps like this scattered all over Rhodesia, with over half a million Africans living behind their fences under guard. The keeps are meant to deny the guerrillas the supplies and support they seek and get from the African population. We were taken to this keep, northwest of Umtali. Visitors are no strangers here. It's part of the journalist's guided tour. The toilets are spotless. The government insists that the Africans like the keeps, that they want to be protected from the terrorists. Africans tend to see them differently, a destruction of their way of life for white ends, not black. Africans who live here are carefully monitored. If a man leaves his keep, he must take his identity bracelet with him. Not to do so may prove fatal. This pangoro, I've got the numbers on it. Well, they gave us this pangoro, they just want to know where you came from. And they just want to know if you haven't got this pangoro, they can say that you are a terrorist. If you have got this pangoro, they can say that, well, you are a man who lives in the keep. But actually, if you've forgotten this thing, at home, uh, especially you can say that you have lost your life because they can shoot you straight, they don't even ask with this bangle. Yes. So that bangle is your life? Yes, this bangle is my life. This keep is not a showcase. No journalists have been here before. This keep is under martial law like 75% of Rhodesia. Martial law means that the security forces can do what they want. This keep is in a war zone. 
People are poor and hungry. Sometimes the gates are locked for days on end. People often can't plant their crops or feed their cattle. The new year holds the prospect of starvation. Secretly, I spoke to some of the Africans who live in the keep. How do you feel about living in a keep? Living behind a wire is like living in a prison. But the government say that Africans like living in keeps because there they are safe and protected from the guerrillas, from the terrorists. Our choice would be to live where we're used to. Even though there are fighting forces, we much prefer to live among them than to be separated from them. Do most Africans, in your experience, support the guerrillas? They do, yes. Do any support the transitional government in Salisbury? Up to, up to now, nothing has been achieved by the transitional government. They'll begin supporting after they've seen something they've achieved. In areas like this, it's the Red Cross that is keeping starvation at bay. They deliver their scarce supplies to St. Peter's Mission, 20 miles from the border. Africans flock in from the surrounding keeps. The cards show that they are cases of special need. A bag of corn for an empty stomach. The wailing is a way of saying thank you. What have we got here, nurse? Pick her up, just pick her up and show me. Yeah, pick her up, pick her up, pick her up, good. Out in the bush, missionaries are vulnerable. Guerrillas have killed 30 so far. But Father Kennedy, who runs St. Peter's mission, is more concerned for the Africans than he is for himself. We've had in the region of about 35 civilians who have been shot accidentally or otherwise uh, in, the, in the war, gunshot victims. And we've had people whose vehicles or donkey carts have detonated landmines. On the pretext of taking pretty pictures, we gave our government guide the slip. Then Father Kennedy spoke his mind, a brave man. And what is the relation between you here in the mission and the guerrillas? I think it's a good relationship. Uh, they understand naturally that if they were to come onto the mission site that would uh, jeopardize all the work we are doing here and I think that they appreciate that and so far they have not actually been onto the site. But we have contact with them. We are here to help poor, sick and so on. They get sick, they need drugs and so on. But they are very discreet in their manner of approach. And you provide them with medical supplies, do you? Yes, I provide anybody who requires medicine with medicine. The government would say that was helping the terrorist, helping the enemy. I presume they would. That has often been the case in uh, this dilemma of the Christian priest on a mission. He must uh, help those who apply for help, though it's labelled as uh, a political um, uh, action. How do you regard the guerrillas? Many of them are schoolboys that we have taught from time to time in our experience in mission schools. Uh, I, I prescind from individual acts of all violence which I deplore on both sides. But I respect them in general as a group of people who have got a cause and are fighting for it. Do you want me to elaborate on the cause? I'm a Rhodesian actually, I think that's quite important. People, uh, particularly perhaps overseas, think that all white Rhodesians subscribe to a particular policy. That isn't quite true. There are perhaps in the minority, uh, minority, those who have always objected to racial discrimination, who have always objected to the Land Tenure Act. I'm totally against those. So in as much as the guerrillas represent a force which alone has done something to get these things withdrawn, I respect their dedication. Do you think that Ian Smith would have made the accommodation he has with the Africans without the guerrilla war? No, I'm totally convinced he would not have done. What sort of support do the guerrillas have from the, uh, from the African population? Well, perhaps I could say I can't speak for the whole of Rhodesia, but I speak for the area occupied by the Wandao tribes people, which I know very well. There are probably about 130 or 150,000 of these Wandao, uh, and I can tell you there's no question about it. They are totally uh, behind the guerrillas. How do Africans feel about the Rhodesian security forces? Well, I'm afraid they feel... Um, their feelings result from their experience. Uh, many things are justified uh, because of a war situation, but the common man in the street, not that there are streets around here, it's rather 
bushy area. Their experience is a rest. You know, if a landmine is detonated in an area, the common practice is for everybody living within so many kilometers of the landmine to be arrested and interrogated. And I have seen the results of interrogation by the security forces. I've seen men who have suffered electric shock treatment. I've seen men who could not walk because of the soles of their feet having been beaten. So the security forces represent to our people here a threat to life and limb. You believe the stories, do you? I can vouch for them and uh, I'm not telling you what I've heard, I'm telling you what I've seen. I know that they are true. Since the wagon wheels rolled north, it has been many years. The country has been built and run by hardy pioneers. They fought the mad at Bealy, and many a hardship too. But flag and furl, we tell the world, and sing this song to you. And you can call us rebels, and you can call us rogues. We were founded by an Englishman by the name of Cecil Rhodes. But despite the songs to boost morale, many whites in Amtali have decided that the end is nigh. Rhodesia finished. The Ellises are off to Blackpool. Had anyone told me two years ago that I would have been sitting here in virtually an empty house with these packing cases behind me, I would have said never ever. I wouldn't have thought that this would have taken place in Rhodesia. I'm sorry. And hence the reason for us making our departure. We didn't think that things would go the way they have done or that things would deteriorate in the manner that they have. We were quite happy to remain in this country. We've been here 27 years. My whole life was here. I've had 27 very, very happy years indeed. As you can see, the beautiful surroundings we live in, the standard of living we've enjoyed also. And, well, it's rather heartbreaking to have to give it all up. Well, I'm sorry I'm leaving. As my husband said, we've had a good life here, you know, and we thought we were here for good, and... I just feel now the best thing to do is to go. Why now? Well, there isn't any future for us here. How do you see 1979? 1979, I personally regret to say that I see it as a continuation of uh, a war because I see no support for the transitional government. Rightly or wrongly, it's not for me to comment. I'm just observing what I see. I interpret that this war will go on a long, long time. Even grimmer is the prospect of civil war, the nightmare the West fears most. The guerrilla forces are divided. Loyalties of blacks in the Rhodesian army are uncertain. Black politicians in the transitional government now have their own private armies. For 79, the recipe may be chaos. In the new year, Zimbabwe must surely be born but only out of the blood and ashes of Rhodesia itself. Goodbye, Rhodesia.